Are you moving it? No, I'm not moving it. Look, it's spelling something. Go ahead, ask another question. This is too weird. You are moving it. No, I'm not. You're moving I'm it. I'm not moving it. <laughs> you are. What's up, Road Jangles? I'm Leon, the Paperback Maniac, coming at you with another vintage horror book review. Today, we are taking a look at Darkness Tell Us by Richard Lehman. This book was published by Headline in 1991. I will start by reading the synopsis from the front flap here. If they were made out of coffin lids, people might figure out the damn things aren't toys. That's Dr. Corrine Dalton's opinion of Ouija boards. Yet when her summer students come round for an end-of-term celebration, somehow they unearth the old board from the back of a cupboard where Corey had hidden it the day she had sworn never to touch it again, the day after Jake's death. And now, six cheerful, laughing college kids have fallen under its malevolent spell. The laughter has faded as they listen to the revelations of a spirit called Butler and his promise of a fortune hidden way up in the mountains. Corey can't seriously believe that they would be stupid enough to head off on a two-day hike into the wilderness on the say-so of a child's plaything. Yet she knows that, game though it is, the evil spirits of the Ouija board can sometimes speak the truth. She also knows that a trip to Calamity Peak would be more than just clean living fun. It would be an odyssey of blood and pain and suffering and death. Darkness Tell Us is Richard Lehman's latest thrilling horror fantasy. Like his many previous highly regarded novels, it combines adventure, mystery, and an unsettling command of the macabre that is all his own. That is some British-ass ad copy right there, if I may say so. Uh, this is a British edition of the book. Uh, this was in the period where Lehman was not getting published by U.S. publishers, in fact, I don't think this book even had a U.S. edition until over a decade later. But uh, this is the second Richard Lehman book I'm reviewing on the channel after Out Are the Lights. And the second book uh, to take its title from a work of classical literature. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the title comes from uh, Macbeth. Uh, because Lehman, despite what some people may think, was uh, very well read and even had a master's degree in English literature, I believe. Uh, so uh, this is basically Lehman's Ouija board novel. Uh, and I will uh, refer to it, uh, pronounce it Ouija board, just for nostalgic purposes. Um, and hence the uh, witch board shirt that I'm wearing here. Got to stay on brand. Uh, yeah, so... This is not just your typical Ouija board novel, of course. This is Richard Lehman doing a Ouija board novel, which means that uh, it's not a one-trick pony. Uh, this thing, uh, it starts off as a typical Ouija board novel, like your standard kind of horror Ouija board book, but then it goes off into all kinds of batty and nutty places, and it eventually uh, becomes an adventure uh, story. It becomes uh, a treasure hunt story. Uh, a survival story, uh, a rescue story, and, and ultimately a love story. Uh, and in the process, uh, yeah, it does truly uh, take some some wild and weird turns uh, and just get totally batshit by the end. So uh, the novel opens with uh, some college students at their professor's house uh, to celebrate the end of the term before summer break. And the professor is hosting a party and they're having fun. And it isn't long before they discover an old Ouija board in her closet among all the other board games. And they get very excited and they want to bust it out. Uh, much to the chagrin of their professor who, who sternly warns them that uh, Ouija boards are nothing to just mess around with. But the kids are like, no, this is cool. It'll be exciting. Let's do it. And, uh, you know, they, they, they bust it out on the table. And in the beginning, you know, it's all in jest. They're not really taking it too seriously. Uh, one of them jokingly intones, uh, spirits of the netherworld, we beseech you to communicate with us. Uh, denizens of the other side, ghoulies, ghosties, long-leggedy beasties, speak to us. Oh, great subconscious. Oh, great id. Get this mysterious message indicator moving. Come on, we're losing our patience. And uh, eventually, the planchette does start moving. 
And the group gets all excited and they ask it, who are you? And it spells out the word friend. And uh, then they ask it, where are you? And it spells out the word near. And then they ask it if it's a ghost. And it spells out servant. Uh, one of the girls then says, uh, terrific. Well, what are you going to do for me, servant? And uh, the Ouija board uh, spells out some instructions for her to go over and kiss one of the dudes, Keith. Now, you know, of course, Keith is loving that. Uh, the girl kind of resists at first, hesitates briefly before getting up and kissing Keith. Uh, and then she asks the Ouija, okay, uh, now what? Uh, and the planchette spells out, my turn. Uh, and this creeps them out, but they realize it wasn't finished uh, spelling out its message. Uh, uh, it meant to say, my turn to give. And uh, they ask it, well, what's it going to give? What are you going to give us? And then it spells out the word loot. And they get very excited and they say, where? And it spells out the word couch. And so these guys uh, get up and they go over to the professor's couch, start digging around. And what do you know? They find a brand new spanking $100 bill right there. And they are thrilled. They're like, holy shit, this thing is legit. It straight up pointed us uh, to some loot. Like, really? Right? And uh, this gets them all excited and, you know, wondering what else this benevolent spirit uh, might be able to offer them. Now, of course, uh, the professor, Corey Dalton, whose Ouija board this is, you know, this is at her house, uh, she is not, um, you know, assuaged at all. And she's warning them, you know, still very cagey and skeptical about, you know, trusting uh, this Ouija board. So um, the Ouija board then spells out the word fortune. And this gets the kids very excited. And they ask where? And it says away. Uh, as in, you know, far away from here. And then um, when they ask it where exactly, it spells out for me to know, as in for me to know and you to find out. And one of the dudes is like, uh, oh, great. Like, what is this guy? Like a bratty kid? <laughs> and um, they ask, who are you? And then the Ouija board spells out the word butler. Uh, and butler tells them that the fortune uh, is in a mine. And when they ask, uh, well, where is this mine? Again, it says for me to know, and this kind of pisses them off, and, and they're about ready to put it away when it then like starts to act a little strange and starts making lewd demands. Uh, it tells one of the girls, Angela, uh, to take off her blouse and give it to uh, one of the guys there, uh, Howard. Now, uh, of course, this girl isn't really trying to do that, but uh, her friends are like, hey, this thing just like pointed us toward a hundred dollar bill. Maybe if you like do what it says, it can lead us to even like, you know, greater treasure. Like, I think it's a good idea to do what it says. And then in an act of solidarity, they, uh, they all remove their blouses, uh, much to the flustered excitement of all the guys there. And then Angela finally sort of acquiesces, feels comfortable enough uh, to remove her uh, blouse and give it to uh, this guy, Howard. And, uh, of course, this makes Howard go crazy inside in a typical layman fashion. Uh, you know, he's, he's staring at her breasts through the see-through bra. Uh, he even, like, notices, like, a, like a freckle, like, underneath one of her nipples. Um, you know, gotta love those attentions to details that, that layman gives us. And, um... And uh, so after she removes it, uh, they go back to the Ouija board and, um, you know, they say, OK, Butler, like we we, you know, did our part of the bargain. Um, you know, what are you going to do for us now? Are you going to tell us like where this thing is? And um, Butler spells out the words, I meet you. And just at that moment, the doorbell rings. Now, that really scares them. Uh, but turns out that. Uh, it only ends up being Professor Corey Dalton's uh, estranged brother-in-law, Chad, uh, who she hasn't seen in five years um, after he had disappeared uh, following the death of her husband, Chad's brother. Uh, turns out he had been living in the mountains uh, for the last five years, like all alone, like a hermit, uh, which explains his, his rugged and unkempt appearance. In fact, when Corrine first sees him, uh, she quips that he looks like the uh, wild man of Borneo. And, uh, you know, like the dude like literally has pine needles in his beard and shit. And, uh, but Corey is happy to see her brother-in-law. Um, and, you know, they happy to catch up with him, even though it does bring up some painful memories, you know, also involving her, her dead husband, uh, who was a cop and was shot uh, in the line of duty. 
And, and then they start talking about this, uh, this possible treasure that Butler had alluded to in Calamity Peak. Um, and, and, um, Chad says that this, that, that mountain place, Calamity Peak, which, which the Butler had, had told them, uh, is a real place and that he knows it well, of course, um, you know, what a coincidence, right? And, um, but he says that, you know, yeah, it would take like a day or two to get there. It's not the easiest uh, place to go though, because like, you know, uh, it's like at least a day's hike from the nearest roadhead. And, um, Corey, the, the professor here, again, tells the students, you should not believe what this spirit is saying. Uh, you know, Ouija boards are tricky. They like to trick people. They're sly. Uh, and, uh, and Chad agrees with, with her and says, yeah, you know what? Um, you, have to, you have to be careful. You cannot believe everything you hear uh, from, from these Ouija boards. And they say, okay, you know, you're right. And, uh, you know, the party starts to wind down. It's getting, you know, past midnight. And uh, the six college students uh, leave, you know, to give Corey, their professor, some time to sort of catch up with her brother, uh, long lost brother in law. Uh, now, what Corey and Chad, her brother in law, don't know is that while they were being distracted, the kids had snuck out the Ouija board, uh, like out to their car. And they are totally planning uh, on taking a trip out to Calamity Peak to go treasure hunting to see if they can, uh, can get this, um, that this, this loot or treasure that uh, Butler promised them. And, uh, you know, a couple of them in the group, uh, namely Howard and Angela, feel bad for, uh, you know, stealing the Ouija board. And they express their concerns uh, their mis misgivings, but you know, their friends are like, we're not stealing it. We're just borrowing it. We'll, we'll return the Ouija board, but come on. I mean, this Butler thing, it, it, it told us about the hundred dollars in the couch and it was there, you know, there could be like serious fortune out here in the mountains that we could get. And, um, you know, besides, uh, th some of these kids really need the money, especially the girl, Angela, the one who Butler had expressed interest in and told her to remove her, her blouse. Uh, this girl is a broke ass college student and she, you know, she could really use the money. Um, and as far as the dude, Howard, well, uh, you know, he, let's just say he cannot stop thinking about when Angela removed her blouse and gave it to him and, you know, the way her, her tits looked through her blouse. And he's thinking he definitely wouldn't mind a few days with Angela. Like, you know, he had never really thought of her sexually before this, you know, seeing her remove her blouse. Uh, and he wouldn't also mind uh, spending, uh, you know, a few days with Lana, uh, the super sexy uh, hard body of the group. So, you know, it's not like a super hard sell. And then the rest of them just want to try to find the, the, the treasure, right? So, uh, so these kids uh, venture out to this remote California wilderness area called Calamity Peak uh, in search of Butler's fortune. Uh, and so we get that storyline. That's our main storyline. Uh, and meanwhile, then we also get like the B plot concerning Professor Corey Dalton and her uh, brother-in-law, Chad. Um, you know, who, who soon discover uh, after the party that these wayward kids made off with the Ouija board and, uh, you know, just know that they're going to try to go out to Calamity Peak to these mountains to try to, you know, get this treasure that, that the Ouija board promised them. And, um, you know, they know, especially Corey, that these kids have you know, no idea what they're in for, right? And, and they need to be like saved. So, you know, Corey and Chad uh, decide that they're going to go out there and try to like help them and warn them, right? And um, yeah, why does Corey feel this way so strongly about the Ouija board? Like, how does she know that, that it's danger, that it's up to no good? Could it have anything to do with the death of her husband, uh, Chad's brother, who maybe had died uh, at the hands of the Ouija board, uh, possibly? Well, that, 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 that's a definite possibility, right? And, um, you know, when the kids make it out to uh, this uh, Calamity Peak mountain area, it's not all gloom and doom in the beginning. It's actually pretty nice. You know, they go, they, uh, they go skinny dipping in a, in a cold alpine lake. Uh, you know, the dudes have plenty of opportunities to uh, uh, examine the physique of, of Lana, the super sexy, you know, chick in the group. And, you know, thing, things start out pretty fun, actually. However, it isn't long before these kids out there in the wilderness have to contend with a jacked, machete-wielding maniac rocking cool shades in a neon G-string showing off his, his ripped muscles, uh, a dude who, quote, uh, looked like a man who might have just stepped off the stage at the Mr. Universe contest, 
uh, end quote. You know, this guy who's hopping along boulders and uh, possibly, you know, trying to uh, to catch them uh, to 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 rape and uh, and murder the members of the group, uh, just like something out of a late eighties uh, stock and slash flick, right? And uh, so, what is going on here? What 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 is this? Uh, could the butler, the spirit who contacted them through the uh, Ouija board, be malicious? Um, you know, could it have like lured them to this remote uh, California wilderness with the promise of tr tr treasure, just so some uh, quote unquote muscle beach freako uh, could have his way with them? Or could this uh, maniac, this ripped maniac, even be Butler himself? Uh, you know, communicating with them. Uh, through the Ouija board uh, to get them out there so that he could have his way with them. Uh, so, you know, is Butler a friend or a foe? Uh, will these college kids get the treasure? Will they make it out of there alive? Will they get laid? Uh, will a couple of them fall in love? These are the questions at the heart of uh, Darkness Tell Us by, by Richard Lehman. So, uh, according to his memoir come book on writing, uh, A Writer's Tale, this novel was Lehman's attempt at writing a quote-unquote uh, commercial horror novel. Uh, like something like, say, what like his buddy Dean Koontz was doing at the time. And um, that is truly hilarious uh, to me <laughs> or to you if you've read this book. I mean, to think that Lehman uh, thought he was writing something commercial and for market here is, uh, is very, very amusing. Um, apparently, this book was inspired by a childhood experience Lehman had uh, playing with a Ouija board with some of his friends in an old dark house, and they had purportedly uh, contacted the spirit of a, of a little boy who had been murdered there years before. And the, uh, the, the memory of this stood out to Lehman his whole life, and uh, writing this book, he kind of wanted to uh, sort of recreate that spooky experience. Um, now, I've said before, and I will continue to say, uh, Lehman's books are the closest thing to popcorn entertainment in uh, written form uh, that I've ever read. I love them. I will defend them forever. Uh, you know, much the way that I will like defend something like the Death Wish movies, for example, particular, particularly parts three and four. Um, but these are entertainments. It's important to to to, to realize that uh, they were written to be enjoyed, um, not really to be taken seriously. Uh, you know, I, Layman's sole purpose always was to titillate and to entertain. Uh, he wasn't trying to enlighten. He wasn't trying to, you know, make grandiose statements about the meaning of life. Uh, you know, he was just having fun and he wanted the reader to have fun. Um, his books are not always logical. They certainly are not always politically correct, especially viewed from a contemporary context. So again, millennials don't take this too seriously. Um, but, you know, one thing I love about Lehman from a narrative standpoint is that he um, doesn't waste any time. His books just go, right? I mean, it, it's almost like he's in a hurry. In fact, I believe in A Writer's Tale, he did uh, reflect that, especially uh, with his earlier novels, they almost uh, were a little insecure. You know, he almost felt that uh, readers would get bored and put the books down if he didn't, like, get to the point right away and just get things moving, you know, with a lot of dialogue and a lot of action. And um, and you can almost feel that, right? There's very little space wasted here on exposition. Um, you are just thrust in and along for the ride, really. Uh, you know, no lengthy info dumps, just, just plot uh, propelled by characters and, uh, you know, action and organically evolving situations. Uh, Richard Lehman was a pantser. You know, he was flying by the seat of his pants most of the time. And, and so he, his, his books kind of often feel that way. Um, now, got to say this book is definitely a product of its time. Uh, there is some classic 80s fat shaming going on here uh, of the corpulent uh, friend. Uh, this time around, not only is the friend a fat and physically unappealing, but she's also a total bitch too. So she's got a number of strikes against her. Uh, although she may redeem herself by the end of the book, possibly. Right? Um, as always here, we get dudes hyper aware of, say, 
the way a woman's shorts reveal the curve of her rump or, uh, you know, the outline of a bra through a thin t-shirt. Uh, we get horny young men constantly getting erections by stealing glances at chicks' breasts, uh, surreptitiously picking up bras and panties, their minds constantly a whirl with perverted machinations. Naturally, right? You can tell uh, often, you know, uh, with a lot of these guys, like when they are at their most excited, like what, like what gets them off, <laughs> in other words, like when writing. Like, for example, like Sean Hudson, it's oftentimes just like over the top, exaggerated, like gore scene. Like you can tell he's really like having the most fun when he's writing that. Uh, with Layman, it's definitely voyeuristic scenes uh, in which the female form is being beheld by uh, horny, hot-blooded young males. That, that, that's really his thing. And, and Layman loves to complicate his male protagonists and make them skate right there on the edge of being almost too pervy like to, to, to get behind. Um, here's one example of uh, what our main character, Howard, uh, the guy that we're supposed to sympathize with, uh, is thinking uh, about doing, what he's thinking about doing to his close friend, Angela, uh, while they're uh, riding in the backseat of the car, you know, after she's fallen asleep beside him, while they're going uh, to the mountain wilderness area. Okay. In the backseat with his arm around her, she fell asleep, but Howard remained awake remembering and wondering and worrying about Dr. Dalton, the Ouija board, and Angela, feverish with the storm in his mind, and constantly aware of Angela's body curled against him. He was very tempted to touch her. Nobody would ever know, not even Angela, unless his touch woke her up. He imagined himself feeling her breasts through the blouse. He might even unfasten a button and slip his hand inside. He could probably get away with it. Maybe he could even sneak a hand under the, her skirt. Though he ached to, to try such things, he struggled against his urges. To feel her while she slept would be perverted. And she'd already been violated in God knows how many ways already. <laughs> and we'll get to that in a second. Um, so, uh, yeah. We, we also get a little bit of... Um, Soap opera drama here uh, between Corey, the professor, and her brother-in-law, Chad. Uh, because uh, Chad, you know, there's definitely like some, some romantic uh, involvement there. And, and Chad had always loved uh, Corey Dalton, but had run away, you know, following his brother's death because he thought it wasn't right, you know, that he should, that he should you know, like hook up with his dead brother's uh, sister. And, uh, and speaking of these two, uh, Corey Dalton and Chad, we also get some outlandish dialogue uh, scenes that only Richard Lehman would write, uh, such as the following between Corey and her brother-in-law, Chad, uh, talking about Chad's pent-up uh, feelings toward his sister-in-law and, you know, why he, like, fled to the mountains rather than, like, be with her. Uh, this is a, a very choice bit of, of dialogue. Because I loved you and because I wanted you. I felt sick from wanting you so much. And it got a lot worse after Jake was shot. I couldn't get it out of my mind that you were free. And we spent so much time comforting each other, holding each other. Every time I had you in my arms, I was tempted to try something. I hated myself. And it kept getting worse and worse. So I left. Oh, Chad. Sooner or later... What? I might have tried to rape you. Her eyes, deep blue and solemn, stayed fixed on him as she sipped her drink. Maybe you should have given it a whirl. I'm not kidding. Neither am I. What are you saying? It wouldn't have been any rape, Chad. Not the way I felt about you. I don't think it's technically possible to rape a willing partner. <laughs> it goes on from there. But um, yeah, gotta love that layman dialogue. Um, of course, we also get some classic layman sex scenes here. Uh, I mean, he's really hitting on all cylinders in this one. Uh, you know, one time his, his old friend Jack Ketchum, uh, RIP, had said that uh, 
Lehman was always trying to give his reader a boner, and that is certainly uh, the case here. No exception whatsoever. Um, I have to say, one thing that I don't think uh, Richard Lehman gets enough credit for is uh, his characters. Now, now they may seem unrealistic in some ways. However, uh, they do often feel real on the page, especially through the dialogue. Now, notwithstanding the kind of facetious example I just made, but they do often have good dialogue. And in fact, Lehman surprisingly wrote uh, young people very well. And they were likable, like, and, and it was actually fun uh, to read their dialogue and, and to kind of follow them on their on their adventures. Um, I, I think this novel in particular has some classic uh, layman dialogue concerning these young people, and and I and I just I just really love it. And if you don't like it, you can just go ahead and stuff it, as one of uh, layman's characters might say. Um, he's also pretty good, I think, uh, layman at getting inside his characters' heads. And, uh, you know, especially during like tense moments and moments of uh, suspense. And, and, you know, he's good at rationalizing their thoughts and actions. It, it's not like in, uh, you know, ch cheesy horror movies where you're often, you know, watching it and rolling your eyes and thinking like, oh, God, like what a stupid like mis like action that that person took. Uh, you know, Layman always, it seems like, thinks things through and tries to, to, to rationalize his character's actions. Uh, he also tries uh, pretty hard to make up like, or to tie up loose ends. Um, you know, even if they're far-fetched and tenuous as hell, uh, the attempt is there. And, and you know, I, I do appreciate that. Like, like in this book, he brings up some things toward the end um, concerning like who this this butler is. And, w and when we learn about that, and then he tries to like throw in some stuff to sort of uh, rash like or explain away reconcile I should say what uh like what he had said earlier right because it seems like he was writing this you know if he if he doesn't like outline these things he probably like read back and said oh that doesn't really gel so he always like includes something to try to explain it away doesn't always work but you know it is it is appreciated and um you know but that being said <laughs> this book does uh have some pretty big uh, plot holes However, it didn't really bother me too much, interestingly enough. Like, it, it did not detract from my enjoyment of the thing overall. Uh, another thing that I think uh, makes Layman pretty uh, unique and inimitable is just, like, the outlandish quirkiness of his books. Like, some, some scenes are just flat-out weird. Like, uh, when the six kids leave the party and decide that they're going to go uh, start driving right away out into the mountains to try to find this treasure, they, uh, you know, they drop off uh, some people and then come back to pick them up. And when the group comes back uh, to pick up Angela, uh, the, one of the girls, uh, and they, 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 they go to the apartment where she lives in this really sketchy part of town. She's living up above a thrift shop. And, uh, and, uh, the guy, uh, her, her friend Howard actually goes up to, to get her and, uh, and he discovers that Angela is living with a, a greasy, hairy, hunchbacked sleazoid of an old man who at that moment when he walks into the apartment to, 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 to try to find her because she's not answering the door, uh, he finds that, uh, she's being punished by this creepy old hunchback guy, uh, for, for having like snuck out that night and gone to the party. And uh, what he's doing is he's making this this poor girl wear multiple layers of heavy clothing, and he's rubbed Bengay heating ointment all over her body. He's, he's applied this himself. He hasn't missed a spot. Uh, and, uh, and he makes her stand in, in a closet right in front of a, a space heater with it's like cranked up full blast with her hands uh, bound to like the like the uh, the bar above in the closet. And um, you know, it's it, it, this is layman's way of sort of like raising the stakes because it's it's showing that this girl is so poor, she's so desperate that she just has to live with this creepy, you know, disgusting hunchback who does these like sleazy things to her. And um, you know, but if she can get that money, that money the butler promised them, she won't have to subject herself to this sort of uh, you know, like de debasement anymore. <laughs> so it's pre it's pretty it's pretty great, right? Uh, this novel also, you know, has that characteristic, uh, unmistakable layman style. Um, you know, he really does have a signature pro style, I think. I mean, like, if you were doing, like, the ultimate Pepsi challenge, uh, like, you, you can just tell right away that it's a layman book. Um, you know, like, he's just got that really, really distinctive uh, pro style that it's, it's really fun to read. Um, 
Although one thing I did notice, uh, again, while reading this book, and I've noticed it in the past, is that Lehman tends to uh, like to like describe a lot of um, sort of like almost unnecessary actions. Like he likes to describe like everything that a character is doing. Like he'll say, um, you know, she picked up the receiver, receiver. she cradled the receiver, uh, you know, she uh, she climbed the stairs, she put the key in the lock, she twisted the knob. He does, he does kind of like uh, belabor those sort of like uh, extraneous uh, plot details, but it's kind of interesting. Like it doesn't really bother me. It's just like part of his style and I've come to, to kind of like accept it and, and, and I've grown used to it. But, you know, having said that, we do get some some solid writing here. Um, you know, there are some really cool dream sequences in this book, uh, some involving the uh, pervy, lecherous hunchback, and also some involving this uh, Mr. Universe-looking, machete-wielding maniac. And uh, they were pretty fun and, and, and well-written. Oh, we also get a cool setting here. I mean, it's perfect for, like, an adventure slash survival uh, horror novel, which is kind of what this is, you know, uh, you know, at this, in this remote California wilderness replete with, you know, pine trees and a big alpine lake and, and gorges and, and uh, rapids and boulders. And, and of course, a machete wielding, uh, G string wearing uh, maniac wearing shades, uh, who's uh, chasing them and, and possibly trying to rape them. Um, you know, it's great, but yeah, the setting is, is fun, it's fun to read, especially, you know, this time of year when the weather's, you know, getting nice. Um, and, uh, yeah, the final revelation in this book of exactly who Butler is and why it lured these kids to this wilderness, especially when there's this, uh, muscly maniac with a machete running around, um, is fucking creepy. And, and, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of weird and a little unsettling and I, and I, and I dug it. I dug it. it. It is the kind of conclusion that only uh, Richard Lehman, uh, would dream up. <clears throat> And the climax, I just have to mention, uh, the climactic scene involving uh, the kids uh, entering an abandoned bus out in a clearing of the woods late at night was one of the most haunting and creepiest things uh, I've read in a while. Uh, fantastic tension and suspense. Um, you know, in fact, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that I think that 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 scene on the bus is, is probably the scariest and most haunting thing uh, Richard Lehman has ever read. And now, while I love Richard Lehman, I don't often find his books scary necessarily. You know, they're more just like pulpy fun. But this scene was like legit terrifying, especially reading it a alone at one in the morning, as I did last night. Um, it was really, really, really cool, uh, well-written, um, I, yeah, I really enjoyed that and actually like kind of lifted this book up a little in my estimation just from that final, just from that final scene. Um, you know, and it does lead, uh, then further to a scene of shocking violence and gore that's up there with, I think the best of anything he's ever read. Uh, and you know, it, it, it leads to just like this nutty and satisfying finale that is, uh, as gory and horrific as vintage horror comes, in, in my opinion. So, um, yeah. Obviously, I am highly recommending this book, uh, Darkness Tell Us by Richard Lehman. Greatly enjoyed it. Um, you know, some of what I said may seem a little uh, weird, a little, little dubious, maybe uh, outrageous or in poor taste, but honestly... <laughs> Those are the reasons why I loved it. Uh, you know, this isn't a perfect book by any means. Uh, it does have some flaws, but at the end of the day, I mean, it was a five-star read for me. Uh, five stars all day, uh, particularly because of that ending. And, um, you know, I, I enjoyed it so much that it has inspired me uh, to do a top five Richard Lehman uh, books video this summer because, you know, the man was definitely one of the goats in pulp horror literature. And, uh, you know, I want to celebrate him. And I want to make it clear that here on Paperback Mania, we are pro layman. We love layman here. We miss layman. We do not bitch about layman. We do not wring our hands and, and say, oh, but, you know, he's so problematic now. Fuck that. 
Okay, and you know, if you like have a real problem with layman, then this just clearly is not the uh, book channel for you. Uh, you know, this is not your granddaddy's booktube channel over here. And it's partly the reason, honestly, why I never uh, ask people to subscribe to this channel. Because frankly, I don't think that everyone who clicks on this video, like maybe just randomly, you know, should subscribe uh, to this channel. Uh, you know, we've got an exclusive club here, bro. Uh, you know, I'm not going to just accept anyone. Uh, you know, I'm not so thirsty for subs that, that I think every single person should, should be subbed. But, uh, you know, do me a solid, homie. Uh, now, I know I'm preaching to the choir here because it's the end of the video if you're still watching. But, but if you, as well as me, are pro layman, um, and if you can at least, at the very least, just appreciate, you know, his place in the canon of pulp horror and you know what he has contributed and done for the genre then you know give this video a thumbs up and and subscribe if you haven't already uh, you are the type of person I want subbed to this channel because you get it you get me man right and welcome to the club and congratulations you're one of the cool kids all right guys I'll see you later peace out